I would like to begin by extending my sincere thanks to Carolyn Kennedy, to the members of the Profile and Courage Award Committee, and the members of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. I also want to thank my family and friends. I have a lot of them here. A lot of Iowa came today. Thank you for coming to Boston for this special moment. This morning I'd like to talk about Lady Justice. Portraying justice as a female fig figure dates back to the depictions of Themis and Justitia in ancient mythology. Themis, known for her right clear-sightedness, was the Greek goddess of justice. In Roman mythology, Justitia was the, was the goddess of justice in that area. But since the 15th century, Lady Justice has been de depicted as blindfolded. This was designed to show that she was objective. She also held scales to depict impartiality. We made three choices that are relevant here, and I want to discuss how they relate to Lady Justice. The first was to become judges. The second, our decisions and our votes in the Varnum decision. And third, our decisions in the 2010 election. Three of my proudest days were when I was sworn in as a judge in the state of Iowa. Like the symbols of Lady Justice, each of us took an oath wherein we swore that without fear, favor, affection, or hope of reward, we would administer justice equally to all. We also swore to uphold the constitutions of the United States and the state of Iowa. I tried to live up to that oath and do not regret my choice to become a judge, and I suspect neither do my fellow justices. Second, I want to discuss our votes in the decision. You've heard a little bit about the Varnum decision, and I'm not here to engage in a debate about the decision or its merits. I will candidly tell you that going into that case, I had no preconceived notions. I had my blindfold on. I frankly thought the state could advance some rational basis for the law, but upon hearing the evidence, it was clear they could not, and my vote was clear. Political or social pressures did not affect my vote, nor do I believe that they affected the vote of my fellow justices. There was no discussion along those lines, nor did it factor into the decision. The upcoming election was not a topic of conversation, although I'll have to admit it was probably in the back of everybody's minds. But I think this is how our founding fathers envisioned the role of the courts. Now, the reaction to the Barnum decision came, of no, came as no surprise. We recognized there would be opposition, and of course, there was. We were called activist judges, elitists, out of touch with the people, and frankly, a lot worse. Now, court decisions every day are controversial. In fact, usually half of the people involved are upset with us. But without the power of the courts to declare acts of the legislature contrary to the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton said, the rights and privileges reserved to the people would amount to nothing. In addition, Hamilton recognized that an independent judiciary was necessary to guard the rights of the individuals from the will of the majority. I had a couple of judges tell me from other states where they elect judges that candidly they believed our decision was right, but they could never vote that way because they would never win an election. That does not comport with the oath I took. I am comfortable with my vote on that case, and even had I known what was going to unfold, I would not have changed my vote. We fulfilled our roles as judges. Finally, we also had a choice to make in 2010 when we were faced with opposition. We recognized that the opposition would surface. We were not naive. It did not sneak up on us. We were permitted under our rules to form campaign committees. But the three of us up for retention made a deliberate decision. We discussed it, that we would not form campaign committees. Our founding fathers chose wisely not to have judges in a political position. 
Had we chosen to form campaign committees and actively campaigned, we would have tacitly admitted that we were what we claim not to be, politicians. <clears throat> we felt that we had to lead by example. We could have gone to attorneys or insurance companies or businesses to raise money, but we strongly believed that the people of Iowa did not want us raising money and being in that position. We were not going to endorse such a system for Iowa. No one appearing before a judge wants to have the feeling that the other side contributed to their campaign, and they did not. We fully understood that this course of action may not have been the smartest politically, but it was one that we believed in and stuck with, even though it may have cost us our jobs. The Founding Fathers recognized the critical importance of the independent judiciary, but many today do not want an independent judiciary. They want to take the blindfold off of Lady Justice and tip the scales of justice. They seek to have courts bend to political pressures. Why else were their contributions of almost $40 million in 2009 and 2010 in state judicial elections? Was this money meant spent to ensure a fair judiciary, or was it meant to curry favor and intimidate judges? Why would out-of-state organizations spend a million dollars in Iowa, which in Iowa is a lot of money? The campaign against us was not limited to us, but it was meant to intimidate judges and legislatures across the nation. That's why the outside money was there. They wanted to take the blindfold off and have every judge looking over their shoulder. The blindfold represents the notion that this fear should not exist. Lady Justice represents the ideal of a fair and impartial court, one that is blind to outside forces trying to in influence or intimidate courts, one that balances the interests of all. We cannot stand by and pretend that this was a perfect storm in Iowa or that it was just a local weather pattern. We must recognize that there is a climate change out there. It is a national issue. Remember Lady Justice, and what she stands for. Thank you.